I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which is a real good Bible translation if you're serious about studying the Bible. Amen? English Standard Version. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 12, concluding at verse 13. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. As we continue this series of teachings entitled, Do It On Purpose, I want to label today's message, Comparison Kills. Comparison Kills. Let the church say, Comparison Kills. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Comparison Kills. The book we refer to as 2 Corinthians is actually a letter written by Paul the Apostle that he wrote to a church in a city called Corinth. If you notice the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, this is Paul the Apostle's two letters to this one church, helping them in the first letter to move from spiritual immaturity to spiritual maturity. The second letter, unlike the first one, is not... Uh, theological in nature. In other words, in the first letter, Paul dealt with what we call Christian doctrine. Let the church say doctrine. This speaks of the basic fundamental truths of what it means to be a Christian. That it would not be wise to seek to live a life whereby you walk with Christ and not dig into what it means to be a Christian. That if you make the confession that Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, the natural expectation is that you're going to grow in that relationship, understanding the nuances, understanding the ins and out of what it means to follow Jesus. I'm not sure if I'm coming across the way I need to. Um, on this weekend, this past weekend, uh, Apple uh, released iOS 17 the new operating system for the iPhone. Android users, just stay put. I'm coming to get you in a minute. I'm coming. Deacon Brown, I'm coming. De I'm coming. I'm coming. Just, just stay with me for a minute, please. But, but we have a new operating system called iOS 17. New features, new updates that allows the smart device, the iPhone, to function at a maximum capacity. Right before you got ready, Mrs. Starr, to update that particular device, they rolled out on your screen terms and conditions. And excuse my grammatical incorrectness, but not now one of us read all of that stuff. <laughs> Those people could have put in there, by clicking this button, you are selling your soul to Apple. We don't even know. We just pressed it. We just clicked it. Because those terms and conditions are the agreements that you make for Apple to do certain things to your device. When you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, there were some terms and conditions that came with it. For example, he says, if you desire to follow me, you must take up your cross. <laughs> Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. There are some terms and conditions in the word of God that, that necessitates us being able to understand what does it really mean to be a Christian. That's what 1 Corinthians was all about. It's about spirituality. It's about what we call theology, our belief systems in God. But 2 Corinthians is not, it's not theological. It's, not, it's spiritual, but it ain't. 2 Corinthians, that letter to the church in Corinth written by Paul, is personal in nature. Because there were some people in Corinth who rose up to attack Paul's credibility as an apostle. They rose up to say that Paul ain't really who he say he is. 
and that he didn't really experience the presence of Jesus, and he's a fake apostle. And so Paul spent his time writing a letter to address his critics and to authenticate his purpose as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a personal letter because he was going through personal attack, and he found himself himself answering the critiques of individuals who did not believe in his purpose. This teaches us that it is absolutely impossible to accomplish anything of significance without experiencing criticism from negative people. If you want to do anything in life of real value and significance, be prepared to be criticized. Because criticism is the price we pay for walking in purpose. You don't want to be criticized. You don't want to be talked about. Say nothing. Stand for nothing. And do nothing. But if you walk in the purpose that God has assigned for your life, just like you're called to walk in purpose, there are some people who believe that their purpose is to get on your last and next to last nerve. And since they do a good job walking in their purpose by critiquing you, you ought to stand like Paul and critique back and say, I got some receipts on my side that validates my calling and my purpose. Because, Brother Jeff, when you continue to read 2 Corinthians, here's what you notice. Paul continuously talked about his ministry accomplishments. Over and over again, he's telling his critics, I have results on my side that validates my calling. So then, your fruit is the proof that validates that you are the real deal. You ought to focus on producing something in life so that whenever anybody critiques you, they can talk about you, but they can't talk about that fruit. It's been rightfully said that men lie, women lie, but results don't. When you have tangible fruit that you are living out God's calling for your life, you will have the capacity to silence your critics. Paul continuously talked about his, his fruit, his, his proof that he really was called to be an apostle. He really was walking in God's purpose. And you don't have to clap back when people question your calling when you have results on your side. Notice that when Paul was continuously talking, Minister Sterling, about his fruit, about his results, he says on multiple occasions, specifically in chapter 11, that I have more fruit than all of you. <laughs> Paul is teaching us a valuable lesson, Ms. Daphne. Please don't miss, it if you're, uh, if don't, don't miss it. If you're a note taker, jot this down. You will rarely be criticized by people who are doing more than you. You will rarely be critiqued and be attacked by people who are doing more than you. Because successful people don't have time to sit around and discuss other people's business. <laughs> successful people are too focused on their calling and their purpose, while people who have too much time on their hands constantly want to commentate about what you got going on. I know y'all don't ever experience this, but I'm just trying to help somebody to understand that whenever you walk in purpose, you will always face some criticism. That's what Paul has going on in this text. But he's too focused on his calling because people who have a vision from God are too preoccupied to be in somebody else's lane. It's the people who don't have purpose who will attack yours. Paul recognized that his accomplishments were the receipts that proved that he was operating in God's purpose for his life. But then notice, family, in verses 12 and 13, Paul addressed a critical issue for those of us who desire to live out God's purpose for our lives. Paul highlighted in verses 12 and 13 a dangerous temptation that we must all conquer if we expect to live a life of purpose. And here it is. It is the temptation to compare your life to other people. That's what Paul is dealing with in these two verses. Because I think we'll all agree that unfortunately, we live in what I call a comparison culture. A culture that tempts us to measure our lives based on other people's accomplishments. 
And some of us spend our days, instead of walking in our purpose, scrolling on Facebook and scrolling on Instagram and scrolling on TikTok, looking at somebody else's highlights and comparing their highlights to your failures. And you won't know if the grass is greener on the other side if you spent your time watering your own grass. If you focus on what God has for your life, you don't have any time to wonder about what God has going on in my life. Y'all quiet, but he preaching for real, for real. It's comparison culture. You post a picture, how many likes? No likes? Oh, you post something, she posts something, he, and, 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 and back and forth, we see this comparison culture based on hearts and likes. And I'm going to tell you how sad it is, that it's sad that in the social media world, it's been said that it ain't even appropriate for you to heart or like your own pictures. That it's been said that it's self-centered and egotistical to post a picture and like it or put a heart by it. Can I disrupt somebody's equilibrium on the day? If I put something out there and I like it, it's because I like it even if you don't. Because if I don't like me, why does it matter if you like me? If you don't double tap my picture, I'll double tap my own stuff. Because I believe what I got going on is worth value, even if you can't see it for yourself. Shout back at me and say, preach, Pastor Paul. It's, it's, it's comparison culture. Your picture versus their picture. Their relationship versus that relationship. Ooh, I, I wish I had, I wish I had that picture. I, ooh, I wish I had that relationship like they got on that picture. And you don't know what them folk got going on. They out there smiling like Martin and Gina, but they acting like Ike and Tina. You better worry about your own relationship and worry about what you got going on. It's, it's comparison culture. And can I tell you that it's a hazardous habit that robs us of our peace and our joy. It's been rightfully stated, Brother Raymond, that, that comparison is the thief of joy. It, it, it robs you of your joy when you're constantly fixated on what somebody else has going on in their life. When you can fully use your energy to maximize what God has placed in your hands. Three quick things. I'll take my seat. Number one, if you're taking notes, comparison distorts your clarity. It distorts your clarity. Notice in verse number 12, this is a Bible teaching, Bible preaching church. Notice what Paul says in verse 12. Paul says that his critics were known for comparing themselves based on standards that they created for themselves. Now, I want you to think about that. If you create the standard that determines what it means to be successful, you will always have a distorted view of yourself and other people because you end up measuring yourself by your own standards. It's crazy because if you are a follower of Christ, your standard is not the world's standard. Your standard, our standard, is the word of God. And it's important that we live our lives based on God's standard and not the world's standard because you can be successful in the eyes of this society and be a failure in the eyes of God. I ought to have a handful of witnesses in the virtual campus and the physical campus who can testify that I'm no longer interested in living my life to impress other people. I did that in middle school. I did that in high school. I did that as a young adult. But I have fully come to realize that you can't ever impress people because every time you measure up to their standard, they end up moving the doggone bar. Focus on pleasing God and not on pleasing people. You will never be able to do enough, be enough, and have enough to give people all that God has entrusted to you. And if you spend your life living for other people, it distorts your view of yourself and others. You can't see your value when the standard is somebody else's standard. 
The question is, what does God say about your life? What does God say about your performance? What does God say about your purpose? What does God say about your interaction with other people? Oftentimes, we spend our lives based on other people's measurements and other people's standards. Paul says, it's unwise. Look at verse 12. To compare yourself to somebody else when you ain't the standard. I'm not the standard. You're not the standard. God's word is the standard that determines how I live, work, and function. And may I suggest that if God's word is the standard and if God's word is true and we believe it is, the standard by which we operate as Christians is a higher standard than the world's. If the world's standard, all my amens about to leave, Josh. I need security right here. Stand up. Just come on, stand up. If the world's standard is to be there at 7.30, your standard ought to be 7 a.m. Amen. If the world's standard is to give bare minimum just to get by, your standard ought to be able to exceed the expectation of what people expect because we don't represent this. See, all my clapping is just gone. Mm-hmm. Go back to the other part, Pastor. Your standards ought to be higher because you represent Christ and his kingdom and you can't give what the world gives because you are not of this world. If the bar is here, you ought to strive to be here. Okay, y'all quiet. Let me give you some Bible to back it up. There's a military illustration from the first century that Jesus used. And here's the illustration. Whenever the Roman soldiers would get finished with battle, they would have their luggage, they would sit their luggage on the, on the sidewalk, if you will, and some Hebrew person would have to come along and carry their bags at least one mile for them. They lived in an oppressive culture that looked down on people who were of Hebrew descent. Here's what Jesus says. When they, the, when they ask you to take their bags one mile, you go too. Because Christians exceed the expectation. Bump somebody real quick. No, they mad. Bump them real quick. Tell them we ain't regular. We have a higher standard. We have a higher purpose and a higher calling to exceed what the world expects. Colossians, Paul told the church in Colossae that whatever you do, you ought to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'll move on. But comparison distorts your clarity. You don't see yourself or others the right way when you live by man-made standards. Number two, not only does comparison distort your clarity, oh, but look at this text. Comparison depletes your authenticity. Paul says, we are not like those who compare themselves to one another. Do you see it? He says that the people that are critiquing me they're critiquing me because they are creating the standards among one another. Um, 1954, psychologist Leon Festinger developed what is known as the social comparison theory. It is the idea that some people determine their personal and social worth based on how they measure up against other people. And even this, psychologist Leon Festinger su suggested that 10% of the average person's thoughts involves them comparing themselves to other people. If his research is true, the majority of us, at least 10% of our thinking is about how we stack up against somebody else. Whenever you compare yourself to other people, you are simply diminishing the value of the God who created you to be you. There are seven plus billion people in this world. But can I tell you some good news and determine and, and listen, and based on how you respond, I'm going to tell you how you feel about yourself. Out of all of the people in this world, there will never be another you. Ever. Bump somebody real quick and tell them, you blessed to be sitting next to me. So when you compare yourself to other people, 
is not just an indictment against you. It's an indictment against the God who created you. Because whenever you compare yourself to somebody else, you are missing out on an opportunity to be the best version of yourself, and you end up being a bootleg version of somebody else. God didn't call me to be a cheap copy of an original. God called me to be the best version of myself. And you can take it or leave it, but I'm not spending my days trying to fit into the mold of your perceptions, your opinions, and your expectations. I did that in high school. I'm living my life according to God's standard and not the world's. You better preach in here, Pastor Paul. Yeah, comparison depletes your authenticity. You rob the world of experiencing your unique contribution to the world when you're somebody else. We miss the value that you bring to the world when you live your life being somebody other than who God created you to be. Just be you. Embrace you. Embrace everything that God has given to you, flaws and all. Let God deal with all of your imperfections. Just love what God has created in you. That originality that God has given to you, that's, that's, that's for you. It's for you to embrace it. It's for you to accept who you are. What would happen in this world if we focused more on self-acceptance? If we taught people how to genuinely, from the word of God, accept and embrace who God made you to be. Thank you, Reverend Pat. The scripture for this morning, Reverend King read it at 9. I had Reverend Pat to eat, uh, um, uh, read it over uh, here at the 11 a.m. worship experience, Psalm 139. Specifically, verse 14 says, God, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he says, and my soul knows that. Very well. Here is the question of the hour before we move to the last point. How do you feel about you? How do you really, like, in the deep spaces of your soul, what is your self-concept? What do you feel about yourself? Because how you feel about you, you will project to other people, and people are going to treat you based on how you treat you. If you come off as shy and timid and, 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 and low self-esteem, guess what? You project that to the world. But if you walk in that bad boy like you own the place, with your head up, knowing that the spirit of God dwells in you, and whatever space I occupy, it's a blessing that I'm there because I'm showing up representing Christ and the kingdom because I came in this space to give God glory. It's a blessing for you to experience the beauty and the benefits of who I am. We don't like that kind of talk. But you can't walk in your purpose with your head down all the time. You can't walk in purpose with negative self-dialogue, talking down about yourself all the time. How do you feel about yourself? Because if you learn how to love you and learn how to accept you, the compliments of others is just icing on the cake. Whether you tell me I did a good job or not, I woke up telling myself that God's going to bless me to do a good job. You ain't got to like my outfit. I woke up and said, boy, that marvel, whatever that is, that look good on that black boy. They ain't got to like it. It's different because I'm different. T tap somebody, tell them he ain't regular. How do you feel about you? Because if you compare yourself to other people, it's going to deplete your authenticity. Here's the last thing. Comparison distorts your clarity. Comparison depletes your authenticity. Here's the last one. Comparison destroys your productivity. You can't produce when you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. It's right here in verse number 13. But we will not boast beyond limits. Listen to Paul's language. And he does this throughout the book. Just read 2 Corinthians. He uses this over and over again. He says, I know it seems like I'm boasting but I'm boasting in the Lord. <laughs> Bump somebody for the last time, tell them it ain't boasting if it's true. <laughs> oh. 
He says, we're not boasting beyond limits. We will only boast, watch this, with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. If you're a note taker, jot this down in your notes. That phrase, area of influence, those three words, is one word in the Greek language, which is the language that Paul was writing in when he wrote this letter. It is the Greek word metron, M-E-T-R-O-N, M-E-T-R-O-N, metron. And here's what metron means, is that every individual who has submitted and surrendered their lives to Jesus has an area of influence that serves as the boundary lines to your purpose and your productivity. Everybody ain't assigned to do everything. Paul says you have a metron, you have an area of focus, an area of influence that only relates to your purpose, your skills, and your character, your capabilities, your, your personality traits. You are wired, he's suggesting, to do certain things. Let me give you a few examples. No matter how bad, you look at Jalen Day and say, man, that young man, he's 25. He got a whole lot of energy. He's singing. I'm a soldier. Oh, he just got all that energy. And you look up there at that stage at Jalen and say, I want to do that. The question is, can you hold a note? <laughs> you, may want, you may see Jalen and want to emulate that. But if you can't hold a note, the mic is not yours. <laughs> no matter how bad you want to be in hospitality, if you don't have a pleasant personality, you shouldn't be in customer service and hospitality. You too mean-spirited to be in hospitality. We ask you for an envelope, and you, you, <coughs> you, 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 it's your personality, it's your character. Everybody's not called to entrepreneurship. Everybody's not called to be in the kitchen cooking. Talking about every year, they always look over my potato salad. That's because it looked like ice cream. I mean, we, I mean, we don't know what that is. That ain't your gift. That ain't your calling. That ain't your purpose. That ain't your destiny. Everybody's not called to work directly with people. Everybody's not called to be an educator in the school system. You got to be called to work with children. It has to be your purpose. It has to be your metron, your area of influence. What is your focus? What is your area of focus? When, when you do that, you, you are thriving in your purpose. I, 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 don't care, I don't care what you tell me. I, you can't tell me that you're 79 years old, brother, talking about you about to drop a mixtape. We don't want to hear that. I don't know if it's in the Bible, but that should be a deadline and an ending point to when you can become a rapper. Talking about you're going to be the next Drake. We don't want to hear that. Am I telling the truth? And you can look at the world and say, I want to do that, but is that your area? I was born. I, I discovered mine at 19, and I hadn't stopped. I was born to do what I'm doing right now. If that iPad died, and if my Bible blew off of that stand, I can tell you everything that's in that iPad verbatim because that's my area. I don't try to go outside of that area. This is just what I do right here. I don't, I don't change oil. I don't cook. I don't do no, I don't, I can't put a bookshelf together, but I was born to hold this microphone. My wife will tell you, I ain't handy at all. I'll make a public confession. She bought a bookshelf a couple months ago and her and some of the members put it together. I, ain't even, I don't even want to go back there. I don't want to church it. My calling is to stand on this platform and to lead and feed people. What is your calling and your purpose? Everybody ain't technical. Everybody's not analytical. 
Everybody's not logical. Everybody's not organized and efficient. That sometimes you're working in areas that frustrate you because you're outside of your metron. That's why it's boring. That's why, that's why you spend the majority of your time watching the clock and so 4 o'clock, 3.59, you out the door. <laughs> if y'all didn't have to go nowhere, I'll do this all day because this is what I love to do. What did God call you to do that you love and that you thrive in? So many people go to work every single day outside of their metron, their area of influence, and that ain't it ain't gonna it ain't gonna give you the satiety or the satisfaction that you think it is. Even if the money, see, I'm a word guy. I, I, this is what I do. This is what I do. Even if it's more money, that increase in pay ain't gonna increase your peace. So you chose the job because it makes Oh, that's more money. It's a promotion. So you got promoted in money, but demoted in peace. Because you chasing the check instead of chasing purpose. When you chase purpose, you don't have to chase the check. When you walk in purpose, the check chase you. Y'all better go back and watch this again, because I'm telling the truth. When you walk in purpose, that's where you prosper. That's where you thrive because it's your lane, it's your area of influence. And so many people looking at me right now, and I'm praying for you. We're going to put some stuff in place to help you to understand, how do I, how do I determine my metron? Uh, I wouldn't plan on doing this. Is that 11, is that 12, 12? No, no I'm not. No, I got to speak again today. I got to speak at Mercer University today. I got to go quick. I'm going to give you all this real fast. Write this down if you're taking notes. If you're interested in knowing how to discover your purpose, give me seven minutes. I'll do this quickly. It ain't in my notes, but this is the Holy Ghost telling me to tell you this. Um, you are, you have a shape that determines your purpose. You got me? You have a shape, S-H-A-P-E, you have a shape that determines your purpose. I'm going to teach this. Number one, S in shape is spiritual gift. If you are a believer, every Christian, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, jot that down, has at least one spiritual gift. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, you can't say, I don't, I don't do nothing. You have at least one spiritual gift, according to the Bible. First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, there's a variety of gifts. First Corinthians 12, Romans 12, First Peter 4, they all tell you about different spiritual gifts. Mine is shepherding, teaching, encouragement, and giving. Now, your spiritual gift is what you do to build up your church. It's for the body of Christ. It's for your, it's for, Paul says, to edify or to build up your church. That's your spiritual gift. Are you with me? H is heart. Heart refers to your passions. God uses your passions to lead you to your purpose. If you are passionate about seeing disadvantaged young people move to a place of stability and security and you can't get it out of your mind, more than likely, that's your passion, which is your purpose. Bill Hybels calls it a holy discontent. In other words, it frustrates you until you do it. What's frustrating you that, that you're called to fix? <laughs> because your frustration will lead you to your vocation. The reason that you can't get it out of your mind is because you hadn't fulfilled that assignment yet. I go to bed and wake up thinking about this. Every day, this is what I wake up and go to bed thinking, what keeps you up at night? And what gives you the energy to get up in the morning? That's your passion. And once you find and discover that passion, it leads you to your purpose. A, abilities. 
When I told you S, that's a, those are spiritual gifts. But abilities refer to your, nat your natural talents. What are you naturally gifted to do that you can do without effort? On the spot, boom, that's what I do. That's your, that's your ability. That's your, your natural talents. For some people, it has to do with culinary stuff. For some people, it has to do with public speaking. For some people, it has to do with uh, creative arts. Whatever it is, you got to know your natural abilities because God will use your natural abilities to help you to accomplish your purpose. Y'all hear me? Where are we? P, personality. Your personality and how you are wired will lead you to your pathway for purpose. I had a young guy, I mentor pastors. I have master classes that I do for pastors all over the country. And I had a guy in one of my master classes who brought up a very intriguing and interesting dilemma. He says, I'm called to be a pastor, but I don't like people. <laughs> hey, I was trying to be professional because this is a professional environment. Before I knew it, I said, boy, hush. Impossible. Impossible. You can't be a shepherd and not love people. Shepherds ought to smell like sheep. What is your personality? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? How are you wired? Your wiring will show you certain things about what you're called to do. There's some people who are naturally people persons. Then there's some people who sometimes get drained from being around people. That's not a bad thing. It just means that your personality wiring is different from somebody else's. Amen. But you got to know your personality traits. There's some people who are naturally cognitively analytical. They ask a lot of questions, right? That's not a bad thing, but you got to know your personality trait. And then E, the last one, is experiences. The things that you've gone through will help to shape you for what God has called you to accomplish. If you've gone through poverty at an early age in your childhood, you may have this knack, this, this proclivity for helping people to get out of poverty. That's called purpose. If you're passionate about education or something in the legal profession, whatever it is, that your experiences will sometimes lead you to the thing that you're called to accomplish. For some people, it's entrepreneurship. They can't see themselves working for, no, for nobody else. Not in a traditional way, because when you are an entrepreneur, you still work for somebody else. And by the way, if you believe that your calling is entrepreneurship, be prepared to work more for yourself than you did for other people. I'm about to take up a second offering on this one. I quit my job and started my own business because I want to set my own schedule. Be prepared to be up at 2 a.m. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? I don't want to work for nobody else. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. But as an entrepreneur, that's what they're telling you, still telling you what to do. I want to work for myself, fine. But guess what? You don't work less. You work more. Until you can build that thing up and put people over it, and then you can take your hands off of it, but, but it's still work. My point is, what are you shaped to do? It wasn't in my notes, but was that helpful? It was helpful? Thank you. All right, everybody stand there. If you receive something, everybody stand. If you receive something, thank God for what you receive for yourself now, for yourself. What you receive for yourself.